we brag about having 350 to 360 flying days out of the year that we fly. I mean, we may not fly all day, every day, but, you know, we just have great weather. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Now, while I was at the Pima Air and Space Museum, the team there have kindly put me together with Tim Amelong. And Tim is the president of Arizona Aerotech and Velocity Air, which provides training and aviation services at Ryan Field in Tucson, Arizona. Now, as I record this here in Sussex, the sun is out, it's a bit chilly, but I'm still envious of the 360 days of good flying that Tim and his team at Arizona Aerotech are able to provide their trainees when they go out to complete their licenses. And it was fantastic to talk about the aviation scene in Arizona and what people can expect when they head out to Tim's facilities to learn how to fly. So we had to start really with the beginning of Tim and how he got into the aviation game. So grew up with my dad being a uh, missionary. So I was a PK, preacher's kid. Oh, right. And, uh, you know, traveled all over the place. My dad had a lot of friends that were in aviation that had airplanes, um, even to the point of... Uh, um, World War One and World War Two aircraft, mm. mainly World War Two aircraft that they had, and um, they utilized some of those to do missionary work around the world for a ministry uh, that was William William Marion Branham, his ministry, and just uh, one of the my dad's best friends, uh, Bob Bean. He sold a lot of his Corsairs to buy printing presses and stuff. Mm. But they, I grew up going to all these different airports, seeing all these old airplanes and being around them, and. Didn't think about flying them, but uh, was kind of very mechanically inclined and decided to go the uh, A&P way. Mm -hmm. My brother went the flying way initially and went back to Tulsa, Oklahoma from 1990 to 1993. Went to school and worked for American Airlines, and it was uh, felt like I was a number at American mm -hmm. Airlines. It's just, you know, you have a huge company like that and, uh, you know, a six-digit employee number, and uh, just... It got old. They pur they furloughed a bunch of us mechanics in uh, 1993. Came back to Tucson, which is where I was born and raised, um, and just worked for Southwest Helicopters, which is no longer. They had shut up business, and uh, but um, worked for them in maintenance. They were fighting fires and crop dusting and all kinds of other things with these jet rangers, and and then did that for a long time, and then just went in. I got a contract with Skyview Traffic at the time which later sold out to um, Metro Networks. And then uh, um, I think they got even after that, it got bought out by another big conglomerate and stuff. But, uh, you know, we were airborne over the city. At least I had the contract flying reporters morning and afternoon, mm -hmm. six hours a day uh, over Tucson. So we'd go up to like typically 7,500 feet. So we were above the traffic pattern of the C-130s and a A-10s coming into DM at the higher altitudes. And uh, initially I had pilots that worked for me and then I eventually just started doing all my own flying. But uh, Cessna 172s is what we used. Mm -hmm. And just, you know, a lot of flying five days a week. So it's pretty easy to do the math. You can get a lot of hours mm -hmm. really quick. But uh, yeah, really enjoyed flying. And then after I got the contract up in Albuquerque, New Mexico for about a year and a half, that contract went away, and when I brought those planes back to Tucson, that's when I started my first flight school, Arizona Aerotech, and um, and then started my FBO Velocity Air right after that. And just my background was maintenance, being with with American Airlines, and came back here though and got my IA, so I'm an aircraft inspector, and then also uh, got my all my ratings and that through I got a commercial pilot, and I don't know, I got probably pushing eight thousand hours total. That's that's interesting. So, having spent many years myself in, in the airlines, you, you do sort of end up just being in this tiny little sliv sliver of an organization. What was that like when you sort of came back out here, start, started up on? on well, your own? it was my little organization, though, yeah. compared to American Airlines, and <laughs> you know, I enjoyed. Not, my goal was to work for American and fly around the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was when I got on with them. I just wanted to work for big airlines and. So many friends of mine that are still there that said that they wish that they had left years ago or had other options and things like that because you know you still got the politics you still got the unions you got all kinds of different things and you just play the the game and yeah. try to get to a, a line where you want to 
want to be. Luckily, they still pay really good, so that that helps most people. And but they're they're in a shop, they're on a line, they're you know they're in one specific place doing kind of the same thing for the most part every day. Where I get to fly, I get to work on planes, I get to fuel. Like two days ago, I was fueling a uh, Lakota out of uh, out of uh, uh, the Watts up in up in Pinal. It came mm -hmm. in and had maintenance issues, so they were doing some work on it, and they needed fuel. So they got brand new Lakotas that they just got in up there. So fantastic, it's kind of neat. When Scott was chatting to me about speaking to you, and he mentioned flying the reporters around the city. Mm -hmm. One always gets the, the images of you know, the Simpsons guy crashed into the into the thing. So, you know, there's a the traffic jam because I caused it, sort of thing. <laughs> what what is that like? Is that a lot of time? I guess flying this similar sort of routes, doing that sort of thing. But you're you're in what is quite a beautiful place to, to fly. Yep. And I guess we get philosophical for a moment. What, what what's what's it like flying around Arizona? Granted, today it's been snowing, which right. is not what I signed up for coming up for some winter sun. But <laughs> what, what, what's Arizona like as, as a place to fly, especially around Tucson area? Well, you got the mountains. Obviously, you're going to have turbulence anytime you get close to the mountains or over top of the mountains. You got the updrafts and downdrafts. But no, we pretty much we brag about having 350 to 360 flying days out of the year that we fly. I mean, we may not fly all day, every day, but you know, we just have great weather. It's uh, there's some huge flight schools up in the Phoenix area and stuff that fly a lot of foreign nationals, and it's because they have such so many flight days and stuff that they that they can fly. But um, you know, we were up at 7,500 feet, so above ground, we're at uh, 5,000 feet above ground. Mm -hmm. Most people that were in, stuck in traffic, or whatever, they never see me, mm -hmm. and we didn't have any specific route. We just they were listening to the scanners and stuff, and if there was an accident or a backup, we'd just go fly that. And other than that. You could fly all day long, and you know it was fun. It was especially when the uh, C-130s or the A-10s would come in, and I would fly some of the reporters that toward them. And you know, I'm at they're at 7,000, I'm at 7,500 feet, so 500 feet separation. And I would see them, and they'd be busy on the TV stations, being live or radio stations, and all of a sudden they'd be right there, and I'd dip the wing down, and they would shriek and yell or whatever because they didn't even know it was coming, and be live on the air. So I had my fun. I was up in the uh, plane. The, the 172's a lovely aircraft as well, isn't it? it yep. So it do, does what you need it to do. Exactly. Cutters around for ages. I, I was, uh, have spent a good chunk of time in, in, in the non-commanding -com seat of, of a 172. And you got four of them. They're, they're just lovely. Go go forever. And I guess for this sort of environment, with those sort of lumpy, lumpy patches coming off the hills, to someone who doesn't know the area, they most people would think Tucson's desert, all flat, but you've got some big hills creating some right. big, big up and down drafts as well. You mentioned the turbulence. We've had some incredible wind the last few days, which would have made flying very tricky. So right. the, yep. I guess it ca can catch the uninitiated out pretty. Usually pretty if you know it's that bad, like mm -hmm. the winds were gusting up to 40 miles an hour yesterday, um, it's just not fun for anybody, whether yeah. it's the flight instructors or the students. Um, we actually flew a bunch of photo flights and stuff over to where we were we aren't over able to orbit over the base, but we can get kind of close enough to where they can take some pictures of the boneyard, and then we'll take them up to the uh, Pinal Air Park and see all the, the boneyard up yep. there and do some passes. Um, we orbit over the P. Marin Space Museum here, and you know these guys take pictures and stuff that love it, and it's they wrap their whole vacation around coming over to uh, to do the photo flights and do the um, just see all these aircraft. They call themselves aviation enthusiasts, so. They come from the states, but mo I would say most of them, uh, most of our customers come from uh, Britain. The ones that were here yesterday, all from the London area. So, but ah. it's fun. I mean, it's aviation is a pretty broad. I mean, it's worldwide, obviously, and stuff. Planes everywhere, whether it's maintenance or flying them or whatever, or just having museums like this, and people travel all over the place and stuff just to go to air shows yeah. and things. Which we'll have one coming up the third week of March. Here at Davis Mountain. Yeah, I, I couldn't quite work the trip to come out at that time. Is guessing guessing my wife out for four days of airplanes is enough. She's off exploring now. But in two weeks we'll have the Heritage Conference here. Yeah, I know. So I take care of all the fuel for both the Heritage Conference and then also for the uh, 
the air shield because they don't have 100 low lead fuel on base, so yeah. I provide that ab gas for them. So let's let's talk about that that sort of experience here. You know, you, you run an FBO because that well, really for someone who doesn't know what what is an FBO? It's called a fixed base operation, mm -hmm. but it could be <clears throat> you could have just like one flight school and that be considered a fixed base operation. Mm -hmm. um, how the FAA I think really more looks at a fixed base operation is being able to do multiple things. So we do aircraft maintenance, we do uh, fuel, we do hangar space, so we have uh, hangars over at Ryan Airfield, we have shade ports, um, we do flight training, simulator training, um, you know, there's multiple things that we do. We don't do avionics, we can do remove and replace or send things out. Mm -hmm. So to me, an FBO is more somebody that's doing a lot of different things instead of just one specific thing, because there's uh, maintenance facilities over at Ryan Airfield that that's all they do is maintenance, yeah. nothing else. People that do uh, avion there's an avionics shop out over there, and that's all he does. So, but yeah, it's you meet a lot of new people and stuff at ever over there, and well, anywhere in aviation. Mm -hmm. But at FBOs, people that come there and customers and all that, you kind of have uh, people that are just coming to look or to fly. And we have probably at any given time 40 to 50 students easy mm -hmm. over there training. We have 12 different aircraft over there. And that's sort of one of one of the appeals for being out here is, is, is that, as you're saying, 350, 360, I've come for the, the 10 days that falls into those other few, because we've got snow up north. And well, we've flown here. most of those days, though. Oh, we course. haven't flown maybe in the morning when the, it's windy or in the afternoon when it's windy, but we've still got flights in. We utilize uh, simulators. We have, mm -hmm. I have three simulators over at Ryan at uh, Arizona Aerotech, and we're utilizing those in the fullest when it's bad weather. I mean, we just... You're inside where it's warm and not so nasty. <laughs> yeah, come, coming from England, we complain about the weather the whole time. So that's, well, I de-iced, yeah. I think, four or five planes this morning, and they went out and flying. We had snow on them this morning, and it uh, it was almost 40 degrees and stuff by, I think, about 7.30, 8 o'clock, and we just de-iced them. And I say de-iced them. We got a hose with, warm, with warmer water and just uh, de-iced them, and that was it. It wasn't freezing at that point, and they went and flew. Fantastic. And... For, for the operations that, that you're doing, you have, I guess you have the advantage of not too many days being the same. You, you're going to get, a, do you get a high volume of visiting traffic as well coming through, or is, or is it mostly locals that you know? So we probably have, I'd say, two-thirds of our, our students are locals, mm -hmm. and then we have like a third of them that come in that do accelerated, that come in at any given time, and they're here for like a one-week commercial rating, or they're here for a two-week instrument rating mm -hmm. uh, we have like a four-week private pilot rating and they have to come in you know with a written knowledge test done and certain prerequisites a, a valid medical things like yep. that and then they just go full tilt full time and get the rating and we have deep local dps that we use designated pilot examiners that are certified by the fa mm -hmm. that do the check rides for us and, and they go away usually happy <laughs> usually happy because i guess that's there's some who don't make the grade some of them don't, yeah. but typically they'll, the examiners allow them to do the whole check ride. Mm -hmm. Let's just say they mess up on the short field landings or something. They, uh, they have to get retrained, and then they'll typically take them out for the things that they mess up in the first go around. And then they'll, once they get retrained and make sure that they're good to go on the second time, then, you know, typically I'd say 99% of the time they pass the check ride on the second time around. Oh, that's fine. So when, when you're watching, your students go through what aspects of your own experience are you bringing into that because it's one of the things that's on my bucket list to do cost being the thing that's been holding me back and yeah bills yep. <laughs> but when you're training someone up how do you take the curriculum but also your own experience to help get someone through those quite accelerated courses because they're, they're coming for a very specific thing they need to to nail it, get through. They're focused. So yeah. most of these people don't live here mm -hmm. that are doing the accelerated programs anyway. So they're having to pay rent, money, things like that, whatever, while they're here. So they're pretty intense on the program. I mean, they're it's their full-time job yeah. with, with overtime. And that's how they look at it and stuff. And they, they'll do everything they can. And then we do everything we can to make sure we meet the deadlines and stuff, whatever. And typically we'll tell people to have a little flexibility um, because you know, accelerated programs isn't for everybody. Yeah. And uh, some people aren't meant to be pilots. Some people, 
it takes a lot more. I can tell you I've seen older people come in to try to get ratings and I'm 57 and I've seen older people that, you know, they can afford it now. Their kids are gone, they're, um, they've retired and they struggle a lot more, but they got time and money. Yeah. So not a big deal. Have some of these younger kids and stuff that, you know, have motivation because they want to fly and they pick up on this stuff like nothing flat, but they're good with these games and simulators and different things like that. And it doesn't seem like, you know, they just got out of high school type things, so they know all the study habits and yeah. they seem to do really well at it. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, in our Hangar 5 uh, with more World War II aircraft. The aircraft behind us is a consolidated PB4Y2 privateer, which was a Navy patrol bomber derived from the consolidated B-24 Liberator. Um, as you notice, there's massive differences between this and the Liberator. The fuselage looks kind of the same, but it's actually an extended fuselage because there's more crew um, we need for like radar operators and, um, and other additional crew members that were on the Navy patrol aircraft. Uh, it also did not have superchargers on the engines because they didn't fly at higher altitudes like the B-24 did, which also allowed them to rotate the engines 90 degrees. You also notice it has a single tail um, versus the twin tail on the B-24. Uh, the other thing that's interesting in this aircraft, too, is just its armament loadout is a little bit more. It has two top turrets. It has a uh, nose turret, tail turret, and two actual powered side turrets. Um, they were essentially used for patrol bombing, which would be, you know, searching for and attacking Japanese shipping and Japanese submarines, um, as well as bombing Japanese held islands. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew out of the Aleutian Islands for the last few months of the war, um, doing patrol missions uh, over northern Japan and bombing the Kuril Islands north of Japan that have, are a series of islands that have always kind of been contested between Russia and the Japanese. Uh, a bunch of privateers were modified after the war as fire bombers. They were given different engines and then usually had their guns all taken off and were heavily modified to fight fires. Um, they were using them up until I think about the early 2000s when they started retiring them because of like um, metal fatigue and issues that they're having with the aircraft, uh, you know, that had been flying for 50 years plus in also very bad environments. I've always thought this is a pretty unique aircraft. It's one of the only, this is the only privateer currently on display that has been modified back into its patrol bomber variant with the proper engine and all the turrets and all the radar and antennas on it. Um, so externally, this looks like it did when in 1945, when it was uh, fine combat. And we're back with Tim Amalong discussing flying in Arizona. As someone who's getting older, you, you're scaring me off a bit. I, I should have done this as a kid, really. Yeah, but it, everything's doable. <laughs> yes. It's, it's priority, though. Yeah. I mean, I was I had my priority, too, in family and stuff. So, But it's just you, you choose your path, and sometimes the doors open, then go forward. If, if they don't, I tell people you get doors slammed in your face and back off and reevaluate. But I was told as a young kid, if you're doing what you want to do, you'll never work a day in your life. And... I enjoy going to work. I mean, it's work, and I there's times I clean the toilet, and I make coffee. I might go do a flight. I may uh, work on an airplane. It's just, you know, I, I do all kinds of different things, but I just enjoy being around the aviation environment. And then, like when I do the uh, the Heritage Conference, I've done this would be my 23rd one that I've provided fuel for. I've done, like, the last 11 or 12 air shows here at davis Month, and I just I enjoy being around these airplanes. And so I literally take that time off from the airport, my business, and I go over there and I'm still fueling the planes. But, you know, at the Heritage <laughs> Conference, I'm fueling P-51 Mustangs and P-38s and just hanging out with these, you know, people like Steve Hinton mm. that are just legends. I mean, it's just, it's really cool. Yeah, that, that must be such a pleasant, pleasant change from what I'm going to say daily grind because I'm sitting Kinda here. Kind of like a vacation. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm jealous because that sounds like a great, great, great day in the office, even if it is cleaning at the loose. But yep. you know, when, when, when the air show's on, things like that, and you're saying that's your vacation, and we know Americans don't tend to get as much vacation as those of us over here. But what do you then sort of, 
what's that sort of mean to you being able to spend time with a the pilots but then also those remarkable aircraft that yeah. you don't often get to see it's just it, like i said it's legends uh, all the way to the point of uh even the ones that are flying the demo teams and stuff they were these guys that are flying the demo i mean they're the best of the best that's why they're doing the f-22 demo that's why they're doing the f-35 demo um i think they right now they've got the uh F-35 and F-16, both with female demo pilots. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a whole different world. But seeing it to where anybody is capable of doing this, if they put their mindset to it, you just have to keep, stay focused. That's yeah. all I can say, for sure. So um, on that, what sort of demographic do you see coming coming through the school? Is, is, it, is it still quite male-dominated, or are you seeing more female pilots? I would say maybe 10% on the high side would okay. be female, and the rest of them male. Yeah, there's still not a lot of females, but there, I got I got one instructor that uh, she was my secretary initially, but she knew what she wanted to do, and mm -hmm. she's now one of my flight instructors. Um, I've had uh, several other female flight instructors before that, but you know, with 14 instructors that I have right now, I have one female in flight instructor. So, so it's it it's still it's still it's, dominated it's, by men. Yeah, still same thing in maintenance, yeah. like. Uh, we were a testing facility for PSI for the FAA written test. Okay. And I probably, we just had a female uh, lady come in and take her A&P test. And kind of, I'm seeing the same thing with people coming in to take their test to become air aircraft mechanics. I'd say 10% or definitely even less than that, probably mm -hmm. closer to 5%. So it's it's probably, you know, up from 20 years ago, but but still still on the low side. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Now, I think it'll stay there. But, you know, flying, it's a whole different ballgame. I mean, it's that's why I think there'll be more and more females coming in and stuff, whatever, and flying planes. So what, what sort of hopes? Oh, let's change that around, actually. The, yeah, the, the environment that we're in now is a tricky one for most people. Have you seen aviation impacted with yeah, the rising costs that are affecting most of us here? Is it... Is it biting, or are you still seeing a sort of average? We've been busy. We were busy all through COVID. We slowed down the first week that yeah. they had to really shut down um, mm -hmm. over here, and it's because of people being cautious and not yeah. knowing so many unknowns. Uh, it never was a um, well. We're we were always considered an essential because yeah. you know they needed pilots, needed mm -hmm. mechanics, all that other stuff, and um, so we never got shut down at all. And even then, I mean. It, they didn't make mass mandatory. I've seen little to no really effect. If people started having symptoms, we had uh, signs at, at the flight school and at our FBO saying, if, you know, if you have symptoms and stuff, stay home or, you know, we don't want you here kind of thing and take <laughs> take a break until you're symptom free. But other than that, I just, you know, I have one instructor that works for me that is has an 80 year old mom at home and, you know, he, he wears the mask still just for, to protect her. Yep. But other than that, it's just we never really made it mandatory. For students in CFIs, never really had much of an outbreak of it. Oh, great! What's the future hold for you as a as business owner in 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 the sort of general aviation space here? Do you, are you just looking at keeping going, or I'm building. I'm actually yeah. looking for some more aircraft, more resources. So it's I'm enjoying it. Yeah. As long as I I got a ten year lease with a ten year option. I'm two years into my first uh, ten year lease with a. It's Tucson Airport Authority runs Ryan yeah. Airfield. But I enjoy it. I mean, I don't look at it as hard work. I enjoy going to work. I just, you know, you deal with stuff every day. Oh, but, yeah. um, you know, some problems, but nothing is not fixable. So you, you, you've, got, you've got that pipeline coming through. So it's expansion is the way to go and, and, and build. Right now, build, yep, build that absolutely. Up. That's fantastic. Yeah. Here, here's a, an interesting question. What the 172 has been the dominant aircraft for, for trading for years. Mm -hmm. Lots of people have been trying to get in into it, you know, things the, the likes of Sirius and, and Diamond and, and things. What's your sort of feeling on that? Is is it keeping keeping with the tried and true aircraft, or, or would you try to change change things up? And I'm going to keep keep with the older aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for one Cirrus, I can have at least five 172s. Yeah. Um, you know, you, that one Cirrus breaks down, or like they had that service bolt, not or AD. I don't know if you heard about the mm -hmm. Continental engine, but they just had issues with that and and grounded a bunch of Cirrus aircraft. So if you have one Cirrus aircraft for half a million dollars plus, and it's grounded, and then I have five 172s over here and stuff. If one 
or even two have maintenance issues or whatever else, I still got three to still mm -hmm. fly. So just not common sense to me is it's uh, they're overpriced uh, people that that like them and stuff love them and you know they can afford them but for flight training i don't think using kind of a little stick joystick and stuff whatever to fly would in my opinion is back to the real world and i i guess it's that that tried and true robustness isn't it, it a, a student is not necessarily the the kindest on training aircraft sometimes and no the, 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 pretty rough on yeah. stuff I mean, it's, it's a rough environment. That's why we're, you know, we're fixing them a lot and stuff, whatever. But, um, you know, we're keeping them up. We have the latest and greatest uh, garments stack in them, but they're not a glass panel. People ask us, like, well, are you going to get in a glass airplane or do you have a glass airplane? I'm like, no. Uh, my previous uh, chief pilot, he went to work for Colette Airlines initially, and then he went to, now he's with Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. And he said every plane he's been with and stuff, both with Colette and Amazon, none of them are glass cockpit. They're all just back to the steam gauge as he called it and i i guess as well from a training perspective knowing knowing the instruments knowing how they work that representation would work on a, on a glass one but having that understanding of the mechanics behind it actually would help someone yep back to the basics yeah. so like my 172s i have on top of the garment stacks we have g5s so mm -hmm. i have no vacuum system they have two g5s in there for the artificial horizon and directional gyros mm -hmm. and you know, so I've got some upgraded avionics, but nothing like the glass panel stuff. So how long have you been over here? Um, we've been over here since since the weekends. We flew in on Friday. Totally forgot that it was Super Bowl. So the, the flyover was round. And, uh, but then we just shot straight up to Sedona. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we, um, we, we did some hiking. Uh, we sort of split the trip in half. So we did some hiking, did some exploring. Um, a lot of hiking around here too. Yep, yeah, that's that's what we're gonna we're gonna be doing. So my wife's out exploring at the moment to find to find somewhere to go. But but the, the fun the fun bit is I get a few days to explore the museum, chat to good people like you. Yeah, we probably have like people coming over from the UK. If I were to guess, we probably have at least four to five hundred every year. Wow. Okay, we have some pretty big groups mm -hmm. come in uh, as much as like a twenty. We've had a group of 20 some they don't always all do flights with us mm. and stuff at the same time but most of them do yeah. so it's kind of a, a good business for me and stuff being able to fly these people over the city and mm. up over Pinal and things like that to see these things from the air that normally they wouldn't be able to see yeah so on on, on those flights over, over the boneyards I guess you have to be very aware of, of, of where you are and right where the so when you say over the boneyard we're not allowed to orbit over the Air Force Base at all mm -hmm. that's been in agreement with the uh, with the, the base and uh, it's always been in, is basically one of the rules. You yeah. just don't overfly at an Air Force base in orbit. You can typically fly over it, go into somewhere if they allow you to. But So we've always tried to be by the book and, uh, and work with them with that. Um, they, um, they've allowed us to go, you know, typically we're a little bit higher and stuff, but we're like northeast of the base yeah. type thing and not orbiting over it. Uh, we have to get passports for everybody coming in, so mm -hmm. they want to know who's even in their airspace. Yeah. So, you know, we've always tried to do it right and just have respect for the base. I'm part of the DM-50 over at davis Monthan, so it's a support group of the active duty Air Force. And then also at the 162nd Friday, we got a Tucson International. I'm part of the Air Guardian Angels, which is a support group for the, the there. So I've known Scott for a long time here, but, you know. Yeah, so that's great. So you, you, if, if you're listening, dear listener, and you want to come out and, and do that, be aware that you you can have to have some checks done because they want to know who's yep. taking snaps of, of the aircraft that are there. Well, they used to have to do the same thing out of here with the tram going yep. into DM. And yeah, I think it just got to be so much of a headache of doing it and resources from from the uh, Air Museum and all that. And then going so many resources on DM site too. So, um, you know, with COVID hit and everything else, they finally just got to the point. And I don't know if it comes back, but hopefully it does i think it's a really cool look over there on the base but yeah we, we we drove around the perimeter so my nose was pressed against the glass it's it's quite something to see it's yep yeah i've been on that uh, the tram tour and stuff and it is it's uh, it's kind of neat but seeing it from the air too it's uh, it's just mind-boggling oh yeah so you've been around pima a few times What's your highlight? What should I go check out? Because I've literally just been through the hangar, so I've not had a chance to get out and explore yet. As we're recording this on day two, 
That's my afternoon. What, you know, what would you say I should go check out? <laughs> you know, if it's something that you're like had a, a big deal when you were a kid, like I had a Corsair and stuff, is there certain things that I want to go see and look at? Uh, being over at the Heritage Conference, going over the P-51 Mustangs and mm. seeing different things. But, you know, I just, I love aviation, period. So I just take it in. I usually do the whole round. We, um, every summer we have a, what they call an aero camp. Mm -hmm. And Scott allows us to bring all these kids that are interested in either being a pilot, some mechanics, whatever, um, bring them here and stuff free of charge. And we, they just, we see it all. We take it in all of it and stuff and just see these kids even just looking at all these different airplanes. And then you'll have some kids that, yeah, that's such and such aircraft and start talking about the history. So <laughs> you see these kids in their, you know, in their maybe high school on the high side. Yeah. I mean, we don't, they have to be either middle school or high school and just some of these kids make me feel bad because I don't even know some things about some of these airplanes and they're studying it. So you're like, yep, he's either going to be an astronaut or, you know, flying for NASA or something. You just never know. Or just being an airline pilot, going in the military, whatever. And that's the, the joy of it, isn't it? Just seeing the, it is. the enthusiasm. Yeah, with the Aero Camp, we'll take them down to Titan Missile Museum, which is affiliated yeah. with the Premier and Space Museum. Uh, we'll take them up in the tower at Tucson International. I've been able to get every class into the 162nd fighter wing into the simulators to where they fly the F-16 simulators. Um, we uh, take them in the tower over at Ryan also when we have the opportunity. And then over to uh, Pima Community College here has like a huge um, maintenance program over there. I don't know if you've been over there, their new facility, they almost more than doubled their size of their facility. Oh, but really? They have a 727 inside. I think it's still 727. They got several big aircraft that um, they have over there, but yeah, it's just, in my opinion, one of the best schools. Then I, I wish they were around when I uh, when I went to school back in Tulsa, <laughs> Oklahoma. This has been fantastic. It, it's nice to to talk to someone who's just got a passion about all all sides of the game. And one of the things I want to do as well is yeah, you know, talk to people who aren't necessarily the the shiny pilots mm -hmm. yeah you know, the, you know, the, the the guys that fly the fast jets and things having just spoken to Russ which was which was great but also um, people like yourselves who, who, who are getting other people into flying which is well there's more than even just the flying part and that's why we do this aero camp yeah we take them over to Pima like I said Pima College there's the mechanic side of it mm -hmm. there's the avionics side of it there's um you know, take them over to the tower to where they see all the airliners and all the airport being an air traffic controller. Yeah. Um, we take them also, I forgot to say, to the fire department over to Tucson oh, International. Yeah, yeah. So show them there and they take them out in the, the fire trucks mm -hmm. that actually put, you know, fires obviously out yeah. if there's a, anything uh, disaster on the, on the airport mm -hmm. with the foam trucks and everything. Just take them down to Titan Miss Museum. Just, you know, a little bit more on the history side of everything. and. Yeah. Cold War and all that, and then bring them over here and see like all these the complete history from almost day one to now, and then just getting this latest mm -hmm. NASA plane is just unbelievable. Oh yeah, looking forward to seeing that. So I guess to to wrap up, your message is aviation is a broad church. You, it is. You can get into it in any way. You can go anywhere in the world and stuff. Whatever, do something in aviation. Um, United Indian Missions. They're uh, they they're based over at Ryan Airfield too. Mm -hmm. They're building uh, uh, like pods and they put pods on these 206s and fly them down there getting ready to get into some helicopters I think but mm -hmm. you know helping people that the only way you can get in now these villages is by aircraft yeah so it just you know just helping people kind of just uh, and like you said it's it's a really broad horizon and it's always every day is different and that's why I said it's kind of part of why I enjoy it so much and it's not really work for me You've had a smile on your face this whole conversation. <laughs> it, it, it sounds brilliant. Tim, thank you so much for spending a bit of time with us. Absolutely. And it's been great. No problem. Thank you. My pleasure. I cannot thank Tim enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. To hear about his career and the services that his companies provide was really, really fun and great to see what is on offer out there in Arizona. Many moons ago, I dreamed of going out there to do my private pilot's license when in the good old days, you could get your CAA ticket out there. I even looked at learning to skydive. And I can say that I am constantly blown away by just how fantastic Arizona is as a place to go explore, but also to revel in aviation in all of its forms.
I've put the links to Arizona Aerotech, Velocity Air, and Double Eagle as well, which is Tim's other company that all provide training services and general aviation facilities there at Ryan Field. So if you're ever out that way, want to do a bit of flying, check out the Boneyards. That is the place to go. So check the descriptions. The links are in there. And please do give Tim's companies a little look. We have been off for a little while, and I thank everybody for putting up with my little enforced absence. But we're back. We're going to be running with episodes for the next little while. We've got some crackers coming up. As always, I'd like to thank our fantastic partners at the Pima Air and Space Museum for sponsoring the podcast and for hooking us up with such an amazing group of guests while I was over there. You're going to be hearing from each of them in the first podcast of each month. And I can guarantee you, like Tim and Scott and the guys at the Titan Museum so far, we've got some crackers coming up. So please listen out for them, including two very special episodes when Masters of the Air finally drops. I'm sitting on those ones. They're exciting. So do check out all the information at pimaair.org. All the links are in the description for them. They're fantastic. And like you good folks listening in, they're really helping to make this podcast go further. If you want to support the pod, best way is to tell all your friends about this amazing aviation history pod that you've found and then get them to tell all their friends and so on and so forth. Of course, if you want to join the Patreon, it's there. You get these episodes early with a slightly different intro and outro, but that's entirely up to you. It starts from just three pounds a month plus a bit of VAT. There's no pressure there. We know times are tough, but it goes to help pay all the bills that this thing inevitably racks up. As always, please give a like if you're watching this on YouTube. Give us a rating on your podcast app of choice. And I can't thank everybody enough for listening. It is really humbling and we're having a lot of fun. So like I said, episodes are back now. Thank you for putting up with me fighting off the black dog. And until next time, thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourself. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.